गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन सो आई थिंक वील गेट द इवनिंग स्टार्ट माई नेम इज रेशी सानी आई एम एक्चुअली अ मेडिकल ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट एंड करेंटली द मेडिकल डायरेक्टर एंड चेयर ऑफ द वैली केयर कैंसर प्रोग्राम एंड सर्विसेज ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ आर कैंसर प्रोग्राम आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू द टेंथ एनुअल ब्रेस्ट कैंसर सिम्पोजियम सो At Stanford Healthcare Valley Care, we've we are proud to have a nationally accredited breast center of excellence. Um, our breast care program uh, provides the full continuum of services that a patient with breast cancer would need, and this starts from, you know, initial screening, diagnosis, multidisciplinary evaluation with a surgeon, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, and then after you're done with your whole treatment, the question is, what's next? including survivorship and cancer prevention so we are proud to be part of a program that focuses on actually the complete person not just focused on treating their disease um breast cancer and for that matter uh, all cancers are diseases that affect our patients not just medically biologically but also they affect their emotional psychological social and financial domains and being able to sort of treat this in a multidimensional fashion is something that all of our care team members have committed themselves to so we are proud that we are able to showcase um you know some of those aspects of the program tonight um in keeping with that total person approach or treating the total person we are also very proud to announce that starting november 5th we will have for breast cancer patients a multidisciplinary clinic um starting at at stanford valley care and what does a multidisciplinary clinic mean what it means is is that a patient with newly diagnosed breast cancer would come to our center and the patient would stay in one room but all of us various physicians would go from patient to patient and see be seen by all the physicians in one day so that's sort of the the promise of the coordinated approach that we wanted to bring to the community and we are proud to announce that starting november 5th in our community our patients will be able to get a multidisciplinary evaluation by all the involved specialists in in one setting this total person approach for us has also translated into not just taking care of the patient but their family and the community this is one disease that affects everybody um this evening tonight is part of our commitment to our community to help educate our community about breast diseases in general and breast cancer in particular and to spread awareness um i think we all live in a very well resourced community but it's always difficult to come across that patient who couldn't get their mammogram on time or got their diagnosis at a very late stage we truly believe that this is a early diagnosable screenable and a beatable disease and as part of that commitment we bring this um you know program every year this is actually our 10th year um it's with a great pride and sense of accomplishment um we can report to you that when we started this breast symposium in 2009 2010 year we held it actually in a classroom above the cancer center and we had about 20 25 folks show up and look in a decade where we have come um today um, i'm proud to report that we have almost 200 people registered for this and we are holding it in this great venue so th- thanks goes to a lot of people who have made this uh, night possible it's a great honor to have a lot of community support um as we have focused on the community in in educating and preventing this disease the community has responded with their love affection appreciation support and guidance of our program um we have a great distinguished panel of speakers tonight that you'll be hearing through with and then we'll have you know question and answer sessions in between what i wanted to do was is is first go through a list of individuals and organizations without whom tonight would not be possible first i would like to thank um denise lee and michelle uh denise estrada is please stand up and be recognized so denise is the manager of our cancer program and services 
Lee Teckel is our tumor board coordinator and clinical research uh, coordinator. Michelle is our breast navigator, and they are sort of the glue that hold this program together and are actually responsible for putting this evening together. I'd like to thank the breast steering committee, the breast program steering committee members, please stand up. It's their hard work and guidance that, that you know, allows us to run an amazing breast care program. Um, I would like to recognize Stanford Valley Care Administration and Marketing, um, CEO Rick Shumway, Chief Operating Officer Tracy Lewis-Taylor, um, and the great team at marketing. If you're here, I think I've seen um, Tracy here. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'd also like to thank the Palm Event Center, Patty Powers and her staff. They make this evening look seamless. They are the ones who are pouring all the wine and, and feeding us all the food. So thank you for hosting us every year. And last but not the least, a special thank you goes out to Tri-Valley Sox. Tri-Valley Sox is an organization in our neighborhood that fundraises on behalf of um, breast cancer every year and generously supports this event. Without their financial support, we wouldn't be able to hold such a big event in an amazing venue. So thank you to Tri-Valley Sox. In addition to Tri-Valley Sox, I'm gonna go through a list of our exhibitors and in-kind donations. Um, they have all set up um, their booths outside, so hope you get an opportunity to mingle with them. Um, I'll go in alphabetical order. Amgen, AstraZeneca, Hope Hospice, Lilly Oncology, Marzell's, Penguin Cold Caps, Stanford Healthcare Radiation Oncology, UHA Medical Oncology, in-kind donation by Culinary Angels, Drivers for Survivors, Hearst Breast Cancer Foundation, Chemo Bag Ministries, Lazarex Foundation, the Sandra J. Wing Healing Therapy Foundation, and two maids and a mop. So thank you very much for your support of this program. Now just some housekeeping items. Um, so the bathrooms are to my right, um, for those who are facing me to your left. We have raffles and door prizes. Um, so these have been generously contributed by various donors. Um, and I'm told usually these are all very amazing prizes. So the longer you stick around, the more the chance you have of winning one of these. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let you know that the program tonight is being recorded. It's going to play on our very own local um, channel, TV30, um, as well as it's going to be streamed um, on the Valleycare YouTube website. So you can check this out if, if in case you missed it. You can let your friends and family know if they wanted to see it. A couple of other announcements. Um, in keeping with the theme of embracing our community and, and educating our community about cancer diseases, cancer prevention, early screening, we are also proud to announce that next month, November, which is Lung Cancer Awareness Month, we will be holding two um, symposiums. The first one is a Physician Education Lung Symposium. That's on November 6th. The second one is actually a community focus event, very similar to tonight. Um, that's going to be held at the hospital, um, and information is on your tables. Uh, it's in Suite 150. It's on November 13th. Uh, coming March is, um, March is always Colon Cancer Awareness Month, so we are excited to announce that we'll be having actually a lot of awareness uh, talk um, at that time. And with that, uh, what we'll do is, is, is we'll di dive into the evening. So our first speaker is, is Dr. Ye. I'm going to read up his brief bio. Um, he's, uh, he's been an amazing asset to our program. He's a board certified radiologist at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care specializing in breast imaging. He's dedicated to providing personalized care using the latest advances in imaging. Dr. Ye completed his residency from Loma Linda University Medical Center and a fellowship in breast imaging at UC Irvine. Um, he arrived um, about over a year ago um, with the transition of our radiology program and has been instrumental in shepherding the 
3D Tomo program, the Upright Savvy Scout and Upright Stereo Biopsy program. And he'll be talking about innovative breast imaging tools for screening and treatment. Dr. Ye, welcome. Hi everyone, my name is Shen Yi. I'm one of the breast imaging radiologists at Stanford Valley Care. I'll be talking about innovative breast imaging tools for screening and treatment. First up is going to be about digital breast tomosynthesis, or DBT. DBT is a 3D imaging method where low dose images are taken at different angles as the X ray tube rotates over the breast, generating multiple images that are subsequently reconstructed as thin sections through the breast, much like CT. A synthetic 2D single image mammogram is also reconstructed from the raw data. And the average radiation dose from tomosynthesis per view is very similar to digital mammography as well. Okay. How do you get a little closer? It's hard to hear. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay. So the advantages of DBT are it reduces masking and summation effects due to overlying tissue. Masking effect is where overlying fibroglandular tissue obscures a real finding, such as a mass, asymmetry, or architectural distortion. It also reduces summation effect, which is the production of false uh, impression of a real finding due to overlapping tissue. And in eliminating or reducing both effects, we improve the detection of invasive cancer and decrease recall rate and false positives. So in this example here, we have an asymmetry on a 2D mammogram that subsequently resolves on thin slice tomosynthesis as normal fibroglandular tissue, thereby obviating the need for a callback. Here's an example of tomosynthesis giving us better assessment of masses and margins previously obscured on 2D mammogram due to adjacent dense fibroglandular tissue. We have a focal asymmetry in the upper breast that on tomosynthesis demonstrates convex margins and speculate, sorry, convex morphology and speculated margins, highly suspicious and subsequently biopsied and shown to represent invasive ductal carcinoma. Here's an example of a simple cyst with circumscribed margins being obscured by a neighboring dense tissue on a regular conventional 2D mammogram. One of the highlights of tomosynthesis is being able to better detect architectural distortions. Architectural distortions are soft tissue strands radiating from a central mass or focus that are signs of fibrosis due to benign or malignant inflammation. In this case, we have a asymmetry on 2D mammogram that is much more conspicuous as an irregular speculated mass with architectural distortion on a thin slice tomosynthesis image, which is subsequently found on ultrasound to demonstrate irregular shape and uh, indistinct margins, highly suspicious, and subsequently biopsied and shown to represent invasive ductal carcinoma. Here's another example of architectural distortion hidden on 2D mammogram within fibroglandular tissue that becomes much more conspicuous on thin slice tomosynthesis images. Here's another example of architectural distortion hidden within fibroglandular tissue on regular 2D mammogram. Another benefit of tomosynthesis is being able to locate within the breast where the finding is. In this case, we have a group of round calcifications in the lower breast that on tomosynthesis localizes to the skin margin in the lateral breast. Skin calcifications are benign. We're confident in the diagnosis, and the, this obviates further recall and diagnostic imaging. So the a pivotal study looking at effectiveness of tomosynthesis and screening was performed in Norway between 2010 and 2012, looking at 24,000 patients who underwent digital mammal alone, digital mammogram with tomosynthesis, and the synthetic mammogram with tomosynthesis. Uh, tomosynthesis in all cases was found to increase sensitivity and specificity for cancer compared to digital mammogram alone and the, there was no difference in detection rates between synthetic mammograms with tomosynthesis and digital mammograms with tomosynthesis. So 
Moving beyond tomosynthesis, we're look, I'm going to talk about tools used in the uh, excision of non-palpable breast lesions. So 25 to 35% of breast cancers are non-palpable. These non-palpable cancers tend to be early stage where breast, conserva breast conservation therapy via targeted lumpectomy is the treatment of choice. In addition, high-risk atypia and discordant biopsy results are typically non-palpable and do require surgical excision for definitive management. So preoperative image-guided localization of these non-palpable findings is the standard of practice. So previously, most localizations were performed under wire. Um, they've been successful since the 1970s, and they're very cost-effective. Under either mammogram or ultrasound guidance, a wire is passed to the location of the target and subsequently deployed within the breast. Um, with the external component of the wire, it leads to discomfort with patients. And with the external component, it can potentially be tugged, displacing the wire, or transected either prior to surgery or during surgery, leading to a foreign body that becomes difficult to retrieve. The entry point of the wire limits the approach of the surgeon. Generally, the surgeon has to dissect along the wire to find the targeted lesion. And because of these limitations of the wires, they have to be placed prior to surgery on the day of while the patient has been fasting, which increases the risk for vasovagal reaction and fainting during the procedure. So along the evolution of localization comes radioactive seed localization, which is the placement of a radioactive seed containing iodine-125 percutaneously under mammogram or ultrasound guidance to the location, the targeted location. Um, the subsequent radioactive seed is detected using a gamma probe. This allows for lack of an external component, which is more comfortable for the patient, and allows the surgeon to determine exactly where to make the incision. The radioactive seeds can be placed up to five days prior to the planned surgery, but due to the presence of nuclear materials, there are rigorous nuclear safety regulations governing delivery, handling, use, and disposal of the radioactive seed after surgery, which can become very cumbersome. So more recently, Sienna Medical developed a new technique called Savvy Scout Radar, which utilizes an infrared activated reflector clip. Within the reflector clip, about the size of a dime, there is an infrared light receptor which generates electric signal upon receiving infrared light, reflects back a signal that helps in detecting the location of the reflector down to the millimeters. It is a nitinol based, which is a titanium and nickel alloy, commonly used in coronary stents and heart valves. And again, like the radioactive seed, it is placed percutaneously. Here's an example of localization using mammogram for guidance. Here on the left, we have an alphanumeric grid targeting our biopsy marker and the biopsy proven malignancy under mammogram. On the right, we have an image of the savvy scout needle in FOSS overlying the target. The savvy scout needle itself is 16 gauges in thickness and can range from five to 10 centimeters in length, depending on the depth of target. After we've confirmed the location of the initial placement, we take the breast out of compression and take a picture in the orthogonal view to confirm the depth of the needle. Once the depth of the needle is appropriate, we deploy the marker, sorry, the reflector as seen here, next to the targeted marker. Subsequently, the specimen radiograph is taken to confirm the presence of the reflector and the targeted marker. Here we have an example of savvy scalp placement under ultrasound guidance. We have our targeted biopsy proven 0.8 centimeter invasive ductal carcinoma in the right axilla. Here we have our savvy scalp needle advanced through the mass 0.6 centimeters beyond the target prior to deploying the reflector. And here we have an image of the reflector deployed within the targeted mass. Here's the post clip mammogram demonstrating the marker and the targeted mass. So once the savvy scout reflector is deployed, the surgeon uses a handpiece transducer to localize the reflector in the OR. The handpiece transducer emits an infrared light, which is taken in by the reflector, and um, a signal is generated reflecting back to the transducer, helping to localize the reflector. And audible and numeric signals are generated on the console that intensify the closer you get to the reflector and help to localize down to the millimeter. Um, subsequently, after the specimen is excised, specimen margins can be checked with the transducer, whereby placing the transducer along the tra specimen margins 
we're able to determine how far away from the actual reflector each margin is within the specimen. So the benefits of Savvy Scout are there are no radioactive material, there is no ex cumbersome external wire, the actual reflector itself is MRI compatible and generates minimal artifact on breast MRI. Also, Savvy Scout was recently given a permanent implant status by the FDA, meaning that it can be placed and left within the body for an indeterminate amount of time. Um, this allows for flexible scheduling and placing the Savvy Scout outpatient days to months prior to surgery. And because we're decoupling localization from the surgery, surgeries can, become, can begin earlier and on time the day of. And also, because the surgeon is allowed to make an incision wherever they like, it allows for a better cosmetic outcome in the lumpectomy. They're able to hide the incision around the areola in the inframammary fold or in the axilla. So some limitations to Savvy Scout are large hematomas either at the time of biopsy or during surgery can interfere with the signal from the Savvy Scout. Um, the Savvy Scout reflector can be placed up to six centimeters deep in the breast beyond which the signal may be difficult to detect. And if we're looking at targeting multiple targets or bracketing a very large target, the individual reflectors must be greater than 2.5 centimeters apart or the overlapping signal may make the individual reflectors difficult to find. Once the reflector is deployed, it's difficult or impossible to adjust the location. So if the reflector is deployed in the wrong location, subsequently a wire localization is required on the day of surgery to localize the intended target. And something to keep in mind is older halogen lights in older ORs may emit electromagnetic waves that interfere with the reflector signal. So here are some studies looking at outcomes uh, using Savvy Scout. A multi-study in 2016 looked at 154 patients undergoing Savvy Scout localization and found the margin re-excision rate for margins that come back positive for tumor are around 15%, which is comparable to published rates of re-excision with wire localization, which range from 15 to 40%, depending on the study. And subjectively, patients reported a better patient experience being able to have the placement done outpatient days to weeks prior to the surgery. A subsequent multi-site study in July 2018 demonstrated in comparing wire localization versus savvy scale localization, demonstrated no significant difference in the specimen volume excised or the re-excision rate. And a more recent study in 2019 at Cedars looking at 293 patients undergoing wire localization, radioactive C localization, and Savvy Scout localization found that both the wireless Savvy Scout and radioactive C localization decreased preoperative times and resulted in shorter delays prior to surgery and no significant difference overall in the three modalities in the rates of positive margins and the total specimen volume or complication rates. So in summary, Savvy Scout has comparable re-excision rates, specimen volume and complications compared to the previous modalities of wire localization and radioactive C localization, Savvy Scout was recently given permanent implant status, meaning it can be placed weeks to months prior to surgery. And overall, Savvy Scout has a better patient experience in allowing flexible scheduling, outpatient placement, the lack of an external wire, not having any nuclear safety issues, and the cosmetic advantage in allowing the surgeon to decide where to incise. And that's it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. A. We will move um, on to the next item on the agenda. So for the next uh, talk, actually, um, we have two of our physicians who are going to be tag teaming this session. Um, we'd like to refer to them as a dynamic duo. Um, Dr. Daphne Lee um, and uh, Dr. John Paro. Their talk is the Goldilocks Surgical Treatment. Um, I'll introduce both of them. Dr. Daphne Lee is a board-certified uh, general surgeon with specialization in breast and cutaneous surgical oncology. Her clinical practice includes surgical treatments for all benign and malignant breast conditions, high-risk cancer screening and cancer risk reduction, as well as melanoma and cutaneous cancers. Dr. Lee completed her breast and melanoma surgical oncology fellowship from UCSF. 
where she received extensive training in all aspects of breast and cutaneous cancer care, as well as complex breast surgical techniques. These include nipple sparing mastectomy, oncoplastic surgery, wireless partial mastectomy, central lymph node biopsy, lymph node dissection, and other melanoma and cutaneous cancer-wide local excision. Dr. Lee believes in a patient-centered and individualized cancer care with up-to-date clinical evidence and a multidisciplinary team approach. In addition to her fellowship training at UCSF, she came to Stanford with her extensive experience directing the comprehensive breast cancer program at the VA in Palo Alto. Her practice is located at Stanford Valley Care in Pleasanton, where she'll be working closely with our multidisciplinary breast cancer team to encompass and deliver high quality individualized breast cancer care with great cosmetic and surgical outcomes, as well as high risk screening and reducing that risk of breast cancer in the East Bay. Um, Dr. John Paro, um, who's going to be uh, following right after uh, Dr. Lee, is actually a board certified plastic and reconstructive surgeon, currently working at the Dublin site for the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. After his medical school at University of Chicago, he completed his surgical training at Stanford. He maintains a comprehensive breast reconstruction practice, utilizing all of the modern techniques tailored to his individual patients to help patients rebuild after their cancer surgery. So welcome to Drs. Lee and Paro. Good evening. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. And um, I'm really um, very excited to be able to, to talk to you about the uh, current uh, surgical option for treating breast cancer. So um, I'll be talking about um, a little bit about the historical uh, timeline for surgical treatment um, for breast cancer, and then I will move on to discuss a little bit about the uh, status of axillary um, surgery, and then um, I'll talk about the uh, different surgical options for treating breast cancer. Um, and I will uh, touch shortly on contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, um, and then the multidisciplinary uh, team approach that allow us to be able to do um, oncoplastic surgery. Um, and then after that, Dr. John Paros will um, uh, show you a few example of uh, how we can um, team up together and provide the patient with the uh, best cosmetic outcome. So the evolution of breast cancer surgery has come a long way it started in um, 1894 when the introduction of uh, radical mastectomy as a treatment for breast cancer, um, and actually it was the only treatment for breast cancer at that time for a, um, a significant long period of time before we have additional options. So that, that procedure ended up with very severe deformity as well as lymphedema. Fast forward to 2019, not only can we save the breast by just removing the tumor, we don't have to remove all the axillary nodes. Um, and when we have to remove the breast, we can preserve the skin uh, envelope or, and now we can preserve the entire skin envelope and create an illusion that the patient never really have uh, breast surgery to remove the breast. <clears throat> so we came this way through a bunch of landmark clinical trials that allow us to be able to, to offer these um, therapy for patient. Um, so the NSABP B4 um, show us that they, we don't have to remove uh, the muscle um, and we can just remove the breast and the uh, axillary node. Um, so that was named the um, radical, modified radical mastectomy. 
<clears throat> and then in uh, 1977, uh, the NSABP trial B6 uh, uh, was uh, showed that uh, we don't have to remove the breast in, in every uh, case of breast cancer that we can uh, remove just the tumor with negative margin followed by radiation therapy and it would have the uh, same outcome as um, a modified radical mastectomy. And then in the 1970s, screening mammography was uh, introduced, which allow us to be able to detect cancer early. Um, so we would be able to uh, meet the patient when their cancer is still very small allowing us to be able to, to provide them, uh, to offer them uh, the uh, breast conservation therapy um, so that expand our uh, ability to be able to, to save the patient from having to go in through the, a modified radical mastectomy. Um, and through the uh, late 1990s to the 2000, um, there are more chemotherapy um, available, which uh, Dr. Raj will discuss with you uh, in a, a little bit, um, which open us to a lot of um, options that we can use to expand our criteria to be able to, to provide patients with, with the ability to save their breast. Um, and the, in, the, in 1998, when neoadjuvant chemotherapy was shown to have the same um, outcome as um, if you provide the patient with adjuvant chemotherapy. Um, that's even open us to a lot more um, possibility because we can provide the patient with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, shrink the tumor, and, and allowing us to be able to resect less of the breast and, and be able to provide uh, breast conservation therapy. Uh, in addition, this, uh, the NSABP B17 um, showed that uh, we can use lumpectomy for DCIS as well. So at this point, um, we pretty much realized that uh, for surgical, when you talk about surgical therapy for uh, breast cancer, you need to separate the um, it has two components, the axillary and the breast itself. Um, it's no longer just one procedure where we remove everything. Um, so the, for, I will finish discussing the status of axillary um, node surgery, and then we'll move on to discuss about the, um, the different options for breast surgery. So for the axillary, in 1996, um, the uh, procedure sentinel lymph node biopsy was introduced, which allow us to be able to um, stage the axilla without having to remove all of the lymph node. Um, this procedure, um, what, what we do is we introduce a, uh, we inject a, a radio tracer uh, or a dye into the patient breast tissue, and then the tracer will get uptake into the lymph node, and we, uh, we have a gamma probe to uh, detect the node that uptake the, the tracer. And so we only have to remove um, anywhere between one to four or five nodes at most, um, and the pathologist will be able to look through those um, few nodes with sort of like a fine tooth comb and tell us whether the, the lymph node has any cancer in it. If the patient has cancer in the node, then we can proceed with axillary node dissection. Um, but if the, the patient that the sentinel node has no cancer, we don't have to do anything further. Um, so that saved a lot of patients from having to go through this, the axillary node dissection, which would result in lymphedema of the arms. And then in 2010, the um, ACOSOC Z11 trial showed that in patients with um, early breast cancer, 
if their sentinel node um, show that they have two or less uh, nodes that are positive, those patients, uh, if they are having breast conservation therapy, which means um, lumpectomy followed by a whole breast radiation, those patients do not have to undergo um, axillary lymph node dissection uh, because the whole breast radiation therapy would, be, would give them the same uh, outcome as if, uh, as if they, uh, as the patient who undergo axillary node dissection. And then in, um, in 2013 and then in 2018, the AMOROS trial um, also show that patients who undergo mastectomy, um, if they have positive sentinel lymph node, um, they could um, receive radiation therapy to the axilla instead of having an axillary node dissection, and those patients uh, would have less lymphedema if they receive radiation therapy. Um, and so you can see now we don't, we're moving further and further away from having to do axillary node dissection. I really, um, the last time I did a, an actual full lymph node dissection for breast cancer was maybe like about two times in the past year. Um, so that's very good. So what about the, um, the people who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy? Um, so the NSABP trial, B27 trial, and also the Z1071 show us that, um, so in the past, patient who has lymph node positive, clinically lymph node positive, um, they all have to have axillary lymph node dissection. But now, with the, um, they can receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and if they have a clinical um, response, meaning they can have um, lymph node positive before neoadjuvant chemotherapy, but afterward, they, you can no longer feel that node, um, then in those patients, they can undergo a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And if the sentinel lymph node biopsy yield negative um, lymph node, then they don't have to undergo um, axillary node dissection. Now, we still haven't gotten to the point where we can apply the AMOROS trial to those patients who has um, sentinel lymph node positive and give them just radiation therapy. Um, that is uh, in the work, so stay tuned. So now I would like to talk about the different surgical options for treating the breast. Um, so we have uh, breast conservation, which is a lumpectomy, um, and then if we have to remove the breast, which is a mastectomy procedure, so there are three different uh, options to perform a mastectomy, uh, a simple mastectomy, a skin sparing mastectomy, and the total skin sparing mastectomy is also known as the nipple sparing mastectomy. So this is what a uh, breast conservation uh, therapy is. The patient undergo um, the tumor removal. Um, uh, most of the time nowadays, the tumor is not palpable, so um, we will have the radiologist uh, localize the tumor for us to remove, and um, we would um, mostly perform these uh, lumpectomy with uh, oncoplastic surgery technique by rearranging the tissue afterwards so that, so that the breast will retain the shape without um, having um, defect. Um, and then the patient will receive whole breast radiation. So we, we have gone a long way in the range of patients that we can offer breast conservation therapy. 
Um, in the past, there, these are the contraindication for, uh, for a patient to receive uh, breast conservation. Um, so if the patient has a very large area of DCIS um, and have large cancer um, or multifocal, multicentric cancer. So the large area of DCIS, um, depending on the patient, we may or may not be able to, to save the breast, but if they need mastectomy, we could perform the mastectomy with nipple sparing mastectomy and um, nobody would have to know that the patient had the breast removed because once we reconstruct it, the breast will look naturally like the way it was before. As for large cancer, we have neoadjuvant chemotherapy that we can give the patient to shrink down the tumor and would then the patient um, would have a smaller tumor that we would be able to offer um, breast conservation therapy. Now, for multifocal and multicentric cancer, the concern was the recurrent rate for if we uh, perform breast conservation therapy. But with the, um, with the availability of new chemotherapy, the chemotherapy has been so good that if you can, if you notice, these are the, the recurrent rate um, of trial and um, center that reporting the recurrent rate from about the 2000 on, um, the recurrent rate is, is um, significantly decreased. Um, so now a day, uh, multifocal and multicentric is no longer um, a, a hard, absolute contraindication, as long as we can perform the lumpectomy without leaving the patient with a big deformity, um, then the patient can undergo that. So mastectomy um, for the modified radical mastectomy is pretty much removal of the level one and two lymph node and, um, and removing the breast, including the nipple areola and the skin. Um, about the only indication for this procedure nowadays is um, for a patient with inflammatory breast cancer. Uh, we still haven't um, been able to um, have those patients be um, avoiding this procedure yet, but um, I imagine in the future, we would probably be able to, to um, help those patients um, preserving their breast. So for mastectomy, um, for a patient who do not wish to have uh, reconstruction, then they would uh, undergo a simple mastectomy where we remove the breast tissue and um, the nipple areola and, um, and, the, and most of the skin and um, just close it. And even with this procedure, um, now we have different uh, incisions so that the patient would, um, re afterward, the patient would have like a more cosmetic uh, appearing uh, chest wall instead of, of like a chest wall with two little um, divot on the chest. Um, and then for a patient who um, have to have their nipple areola complex removed, then we can offer them skin sparing mastectomy where we take the breast and preserving the, um, the entire skin envelope. Um, these patients would uh, undergo either a uh, tissue expander placement or a, an immediate reconstruction by the plastic surgeon. And then this, um, this is the latest um, option for, um, for surgical therapy is the nipple sparing mastectomy where we um, remove the breast and we uh, preserve the entire skin envelope including the skin over the nipple areola. Um, so the most worrisome complication for this procedure of course is the the nipple not surviving. Uh, so most of the time we um, 
perform this procedure um, in, in a two-stage procedure where we would remove the, uh, the breast and then the plastic surgeon will uh, place a tissue expander. Um, so the, um, the tissue expander was, would be kind of empty and then um, at first or very um, low volume fill and then over the next couple months, they, um, the tissue expander will uh, gradually got expanded so that the skin envelope will um, turn back to a full breast size and then it got replaced with a final reconstruction. Uh, for patients with really large breasts, they, they, it will be a three-stage procedure where the patient will get uh, a lumpectomy to remove the tumor and at the same time has breast reduction on both sides. Um, and then six months later, we come back in and remove the breast and then it's, um, it's the stage procedure as well. So how safe is this? Um, this is the data that we reported by the, the group at UCSF where this uh, technique was pioneers. Um, so when we do uh, perform to total skin sparing mastectomy for uh, prophylactic for a patient with um, genetic mutation, um, they, the incidence of breast cancer is um, very, very low, as you can see. And for a therapeutic indication, they, um, the recurrent is about um, 10%. Um, the, the caveat is that when we perform this procedure for therapeutic, um, we always have to um, submit the, um, the nipple um, margins separately so that the pathologist can uh, look through the, that, um, that small amount of tissue right under the nipple uh, carefully to make sure that there's no cancer in there. If there is, then, then we don't have a choice but have to remove the nipple. Um, but we always give the patient the benefit of the doubt um, and perform the tissue, the total skin sparing mastectomy and submit the, the nipple uh, margin. And um, also this is the, the latest uh, data that uh, reported from one center. Um, as you can see, the, the rate of recurrent is 4.1%, uh, is um, and this is a 10-year a uh, follow-up. Um, and also, the distant metastasis and uh, the survival rate is, um, is uh, comparable to um, a regular mastectomy. So for patients who come to us, um, a lot of the time the patient will say, well, you know, take my breast off, I don't, I want to be able to live. Um, our philosophy is that we only need to take away as much as we need um, or as much as the patient need to have removed. Um, so if we don't have to um, remove the entire breast, there is no reason why we should um, because once we remove something, we can't put it back, but we can always take some more. Um, so I always uh, discuss with patients this data where when compare breast conservation therapy with mastectomy, um, the survival is actually better with patients who receive uh, breast conservation therapy rather than mastectomy, which is a little surprising to patients, but, um, but the data um, is what we see. Um, and also, uh, the, the false um, sense of security when patients receive mastectomy is that is that if you take my breast, then I don't have to worry about ever having breast cancer again. Um, that is not true because we, there is not a way where we can guarantee you that when we perform mastectomy, we can remove 100% of the breast tissue. 
Um, so even if you have a mastectomy, it doesn't mean that you have no breast tissue left. There's still a small, small chance of having breast cancer um, because uh, as this study show, there is always a little bit of breast tissue left under the, the, um, on the flap that we left behind. It just removes most of the breast tissue so that, so that you have less breast tissue to worry about developing breast cancer. And as you can see, the, the advantage of breast conservation therapy is, is to preserve the breast and um, we can combine the uh, removal of the uh, breast tissue with uh, multiple oncoplastic um, technique to um, sort of reform the breast. Uh, and what about contralateral prophylactic mastectomy? Um, so the risk of um, developing breast cancer on the contralateral breast has gone down tremendously since uh, we have better chemotherapy and also tamoxifen and anti-estrogen therapy. Um, and so there is, if the contralateral breast has no cancer, um, there really isn't um, any benefit to removing that breast as well. Um, as shown here in the study in 2014, there is absolutely no survival advantage. Um, so the only time uh, when we would offer contralateral uh, mastectomy is if the patient desired to have that removed for symmetry and, um, and also a patient with uh, genetic mutation. So the goal for breast cancer surgery used to be excising the cancer and ensure good long-term local control. But with the advent of um, chemotherapy and radiation therapy, is that we have achieved, um, you, we've been very successful in treating breast cancer that patients are living for a long, much longer time uh, after they have breast cancer. So now, in addition to that, we have to worry about um, minimizing the scar. We have to, to make sure that they, the shape of the breast is, uh, is uh, retained. Um, and we want to make sure that these women receive um, symmetry to their breast because they have to live with it for a long time and to optimize their quality of life. And so the traditional uh, breast conservation therapy, um, looking at this study, we, we haven't achieved those goals. Um, so in the past, um, breast uh, mastectomy is pretty much the only option we have. But today, we have a lot of options. We have screening mammogram to for early detection, we have um, breast conservation therapy, we have um, nipple sparing mastectomy, um, and so we need to put all these uh, modality together so that we can give the patient the best outcome. So we, um, in the past 10 years, breast cancer treatment has become a multidisciplinary team approach. And with that, um, we're able to uh, bring together um, a team and, and practically bring together the um, cancer surgeon and the plastic surgeon so that the patient will get both an oncologic uh, safe um, outcome and um, also cosmetic outcome. So every um, therapy that we offer to the patient uh, is way, um, is balanced between those two things. So as an example, a woman, uh, a 40 year old woman with um, <clears throat> invasive breast cancer in two spot and a positive node, um, in the past, she will need a modified radical mastectomy 
um, and she would get chemotherapy and radiation therapy um, and have delayed reconstruction. So um, this is what she will have, so not a great uh, option. But um, with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, we can take away the mastectomy and um, the axillary node dissection. Uh, she still need a radiation therapy. Um, she may or may not need uh, reconstruction. So she would be able to save her breast, but she would leave, would be left with a, an asymmetry like this. It's a little bit better, but not great. But if when we do the lumpectomy, we have the plastic surgeon um, perform bilateral breast reconstruction, then the patient will have a symmetrical breast, which is a very great outcome. Um, so for this cancer, um, these three options uh, give her exactly the same outcome. But the last option would give her the best outcome that she would be happy with. So I, I borrowed this slide from Laura Esselman, and I love this slide because with all the modality we have today, we can personalize the, the, um, the patient treatment and monitor the response uh, and be able to escalate or de-escalate the therapy so that it will fit with the patient. Thank you. All right, hi everybody. I will. Uh, I know we're running a little bit behind. I'll try to make up some time. I'm John Parr, I'm a plastic surgeon, um, and I'm going to kind of dovetail off of what Dr. Lee was talking about and talk a little bit about the reconstructive options that are available today for breast cancer therapy. Um, I am not nearly as smart as the other people that are talking. It's going to be mostly show and tell photos. My wife likes to make fun of my presentations that they're just pictures, and that's kind of what I do for a living. So, um, but it really is. I think. I think it's important when people come into my office that they recognize that Dr. Lee is partly in control. The patient is partly in control. And I am there to help facilitate what's safe and discuss the options available for that specific cancer and for your specific goals. Um, and that's different for a lot of women because the cancer is different and patient preferences are different. And we're going to go through just quickly what some of those options are. Um, and there are a lot, of, a lot of photographs to sort of describe it because I think that is, is helpful. Um, but briefly, we're gonna talk about all of these reconstructive options, including no treatment. Uh, and the first thing I always tell someone that comes into my room is that I do not need to be involved and that it's not a sales pitch when you come into my office. I just want you to know what the options are. And there were some really kind of depressing studies over the last few years that only about 20% of women that are diagnosed with breast cancer are really aware of the broad range of reconstructive options that are available to them, and that's really sad. Um, and so that's the main thing that I try to provide in my clinic, is just information. It's an information gathering session and nothing more. Um, but so no surgical treatment is always an option. Um, you can do reconstruction when breast conservation or a lumpectomy is being performed. You can do reconstruction after a mastectomy, and there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, you can reconstruct a nipple if that had to be taken as part of the uh, procedure. And actually, symmetry procedures, if there's only a cancer on one side and then they look different, you can do breast lifts or slight increases in size on the side that didn't have cancer, and that's all federally mandated to be covered by insurance. So a lot of things that people, people aren't aware of. Um, but the first option is no surgical treatment, and if there's a, lump, a mastectomy required or a lumpectomy required, um, one option is that I'm not involved at all, and this is a, a very common thing that would happen after simple mastectomies. Um, and you can get a, a bra with an external prosthetic, and the vast majority of people that you interact with on a daily basis won't know. And for many women, this is a reasonable option. And for certain people that have other health problems, or it might not be safe to add the extra steps and the extra possible complications of a reconstruction, this is a very reasonable option for some women. And I always start that this is one way that we can go. Um, 
when someone is choosing to have a lumpectomy or what we call breast conservation therapy, there's a couple of different times or methods that I can be involved. And one is right away, so I can be involved at the time of the operation. And either, if it's a small um, cancer on a relatively large breast, we can kind of just rearrange some tissue and make it look as nice as possible to improve symmetry at the time. One really nice option that Dr. Lee touched on is that if you've always had somewhat large breasts to begin with, and based on where that cancer is, I can actually help design a breast reduction in a way that removes that cancer, but treats both breasts all at once. And so you end up getting a breast reduction um, and it'll lift at the same time as your, as your cancer therapy. And you can also be involved after lumpectomy. If you do a lumpectomy and then there's some asymmetries, I can get involved by rearranging tissues afterwards or adding a small implant to that side or doing a lift to the other side to make them a little bit more even or even doing something called fat grafting where you actually do a little bit of liposuction, you purify that fat and you add it to boost volume to that kind of the concavity that was there from the lumpectomy. Because if you got diagnosed with breast cancer, you should get some free liposuction from the insurance company and I'm happy to provide that. Um, because you deserve it. Um, and just a couple of photos. This is an example of like a uh, breast reduction that there is, you know, a lumpectomy. It's in an area that I can reduce it. It was a woman that had always kind of wanted to have a breast reduction. So you do a breast reduction and then they look really nice afterwards and you get the benefit of like, oh my goodness, my neck and back feels better and, um, and the cancer is treated and it can be a really nice cosmetic outcome. Um, after lumpectomy, so people that come to me after a lumpectomy has already happened, there's a couple of options. This woman had, you can tell that the right side has been radiated, which is why the skin is dark. She had a lumpectomy. Um, and I added a little bit of fat to the, increase the volume. And often after radiation, that breast will then be a little bit perkier because it sort of shrinks up the skin and makes it kind of tight and high, whereas the other breast after kids and things like that can be a little bit droopier. So this woman had some fat grafting to the right, some liposuction of the, of the flanks, and then a breast lift on the left to sort of bring it up and make them even in, in clothes. Um, this was another woman that had a uh, lumpectomy on the right side, um, and it was a relatively sizable defect, and so we kind of treated that with an implant on that side to restore the volume um, after the fact. Um, one of the more common things that I do for mastectomies, you know, we, we, there's two different ways that you can reconstruct an entire breast after a mastectomy has been performed, and one is an implant-based reconstruction where you utilize a device to help reconstruct the breast form and shape, um, and we'll talk about that first. Um, and typically this is done in two stages. Um, this device on the top is called a tissue expander. It's typically placed at the time of the operation and can be filled from basically nothing, almost flat, just the kind of the volume of the device itself. And then it can be filled up or expanded over time to add size to that chest. And you see that little needle that's going into the port. That can be accessed after the fact, so we can start at a relatively low volume so that there's not too much stress or pressure on the chest. And then we can add more volume over time. Um, one thing that's nice about this is that it allows me not to overstress the skin that has already been stressed from the mastectomy. Um, and it also gives us a lot of control. The patient it can kind of say, you know what, now I'm happy, like this is a good size and we can be a similar size to your before the surgery. You can be a little bit smaller if you've always wanted to be a little bit smaller. You can be a little bit bigger if you've always wanted to be a little bit bigger. And we have the benefit of kind of filling up a little bit uh, of volume each week or two and then you kind of coming back and saying this is it. This is kind of where I'm, um, I'm happiest. And then we typically swap it out for a kind of more softer and natural uh, implant like the one underneath. That's a silicone implant that's been cut in half. And I showed that to show that the, the current implants, it's not like a liquid syrup inside. It really is this thick gel, and so the, the, the worry that people have about the implants leaking or having this kind of bag full of kind of like caro syrup is, is kind of in the past because it really is this thick, cohesive gel. Um, and there's lots of different options. So this is a patient that had a right-sided mastectomy and a breast reconstruction. You can see from an overall breast shape, they're relatively even. You can see how the um, scar was designed. We'll get into this a little bit, but that's not her nipple. That was completely reconstructed um, on the mastectomy side with a tattoo and a little projection. So um, you can make it look, even if the nipple had to be removed, you can make it look pretty nice um, from, from photographic uh, um, standpoint. Uh, occasionally the nipple does have to be removed on one or both sides and in that situation this is someone that hasn't either, I forget if she didn't want nipple reconstruction or we hadn't done it yet, but this is what kind of the more traditional horizontal scar along the breast can be like. And again, not visible to anyone else unless they're seeing her naked. Um, and different women have different thoughts on how important it is to reconstruct the nipple afterwards. Some people decide to be like this um, when it's all said and done, but still a very nice shape and nice symmetry to the breasts. Um, 
This is someone that had a prophylactic mastectomy, so this was her prior to surgery, and this is her after surgery. And not exactly the same, but still very nice, and you can see that that incision was hidden underneath the breast fold, so in the photo, pretty hard to even see, and we were able to, those are her nipples that were kept during the procedure. Um, Another whole category of uh, breast reconstruction after a mastectomy is what we call it autologous reconstructions, where you use your own body's tissue to create a, uh, a breast mound. And the benefit of that is that unlike, you know, implants are very nice and they're soft and they're squishy and, um, and they've come a long way, but they don't feel quite like the exact same as a breast tissue. And we try to use your own skin or tissue to recreate a natural appearance and shape and feel to the breast. Um, and there's, it's evolved over time. They used to use the back muscle, they used to use uh, all of your six-pack muscles, and it's evolved to get more and more um, safe and, uh, and an easier kind of recovery for the patient. So they used to use that big pull-up muscle called the latissimus, and they would take it with some skin and flip it over. And this was a woman that had had significant radiation, and I think it had a previous abdominal surgery that didn't allow me to use her tummy tissue, so we used the back muscle and brought it over, um, and then reconstructed a nipple from there. A more common thing is to use the tummy. So basically, we talked about why not get a free liposuction, why not get a free tummy tuck and then make a breast out of that. So we can actually do a tummy tuck, keep the blood vessels that are attached to that skin and fat, hook them up under a microscope to the blood vessels that they use for cardiac surgery, and then make a breast that kind of survives. It's like a self-transplant. Um, and if you sort of feel your tummy a little bit, it feels kind of soft and squishy sometimes like a breast, and so we make a breast out of that, and then you get the benefit of both. Um, and this is someone who had knew that they were gonna need both chemo and radiation after a mastectomy, so they decided to do a reconstruction afterwards. This was the mastectomy, um, and this was her kind of after radiation, and then we used the tummy tissue to make both breasts, um, tattooed the nipples, and kind of recreated it from scratch. So you can make a really nice result, and the benefit of this, it's a larger upfront investment because it's a longer recovery, it's a little bit more uh, a complex of an operation. Um, but there's no maintenance, there's no foreign bodies, and there's no implants to sort of be worried about afterwards. And so it can be a really nice option for, for people. Um, this was a woman who had a one-sided reconstruction, and then I, I showed this one because you can see kind of the tummy tuck scar um, at like six months or so, it starts to fade pretty nicely. Um, and so that's kind of what, what we consider the gold standard of, of your own tissue reconstruction. And then briefly, nipple reconstruction has involved a lot too. You, again, and I always start with we don't need a, a nipple necessarily, and it's the woman's choice. More, a lot of women choose to proceed in some fashion, and some women decide to just leave it with nothing, and it's all um, up to the patient. Uh, but we can do a little local, what we call local flaps, where we rearrange the skin to sort of create something that projects and sticks out a little bit, which is nice for a lot of women. If you've only had a nipple removed on one side and you have a large enough nipple on the other side, I can actually take part of that and use it as a little graft um, and kind of share it from one side to the other. And increasingly, I've been doing a lot of 3D tattooing. There's, there's some wonderful tattoo artists in the area that do phenomenal tattoo work that um, a lot of women just kind of choose to do, to do that now. Um, and obviously, nipple sparing mastectomy in certain indications is a wonderful way to, to save the nipple. Um, but this is someone that where we kind of designed a little projecting flap where we sort of um, rearrange tissue and get it to stick out like a little little button. Um, and then this is a nipple sharing where we use part of that little circle and then we can tattoo an areola around it afterwards. And then increasingly common is this a nipple reconstruction. That's all one, just a flat surface tattoo. And in the mirror and in photos, it really is the details incredible. Um, I don't do that. I, I think I have her name on there. Yeah, Jill Hoyer, she's in Los Gatos and she's wonderful. Um, and she's not like, it's not like her, she has a tattoo parlor in the, uh, parlor in the tenderloin. She has like a very nice office for you to go to. Um, and patients have a really, really nice experience there. So um, this is a kind of rapid fire, 10 minute overview of breast reconstruction. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions kind of after the talk if people have more specific um, things on, on their mind. But uh, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Daphne and John, for those um, stimulating talks. We're going to move down uh, the agenda. Uh, so next, we're going to be actually um, uh, having uh, Edith Rockhill, who's actually a patient, uh, who will be sharing her story regarding the Women in Need Fund, and Shake um, Sulikian, who's the Executive Director of the Valakir Charitable Foundation. So I'd like to invite them onto the stage.
Hello. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm always nervous when I come up here. I want to thank the women in need because they were all so great with uh, all my garments and everything I need. All the doctors. Uh, I'm a two-time cancer survivor. Uh, this is a year this month, actually, that I'm cancer-free. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I want to especially thank Dr. Shawnee. Uh, when I found out, I was devastated, of course. Uh, the family, I have a great family support. So when I was going into his office, I'm like, live an hour away, I'm crying all the way, and I'm devastated. And of course, when I get in his office, it seems like he took an hour to get in there, but it's probably not even five minutes. But when I went in, it was like, ah, oh, I'm not going to survive. This is it. But Dr. Shawnee, thank you, because by the time he finished with me, telling me what was going on, what was going to happen. I went out of that office with a really great smile and I thinking, I'm going to be okay. He is going to take care of me. And, <coughs> excuse me, and thank you, you did. But like I said, thank you. I've been with probably Valley Care for, <coughs> excuse me, all my doctors for at least 14 years now. And I wouldn't leave them for nothing. So thank you very much for having me here. And have a great night. <laughs> Thank you, Edith, for your willingness to share your personal experience. Uh, many of us in the room have been uh, touched by breast cancer and having a real e example and a real um, story really helps bring it home uh, for us. Uh, I'm so glad that the Women in Need Fund um, has been there for you and other breast cancer patients. The fund was established in 2010 by local dentists, Dr. Jeff Bueno and Tom Selleck, in memory of their mothers who passed away from breast cancer. The Women in Need Fund provides financial assistance to patients in our community during their treatment and recovery from breast cancer. Um, the fund, which is 100% donor supported, has helped over 575 patients. Uh, donations to the fund help to alleviate the financial burden of breast cancer diagnosis, treatment, and recovery, so patients like Edith can focus on what's most important, their recovery. Valley Care Charitable Foundation is honored to play a role in supporting local patients during their breast cancer journey. VCCF is dedicated to the health and betterment of the Tri-Valley through the ongoing funding of our local nonprofit hospital, Stanford Healthcare Valley Care, and its innovative medical programs. Forward thinking and community driven, we help ensure that you and your loved ones have world-class medical care, and it really truly is world-class medical care, as you've heard um, already from people in our, uh, our program. Um, provide care to you right here in your backyard and close to home. Life-saving solutions don't just happen. They require an ongoing commitment. We appreciate the community's investment in our local nonprofit hospital for the past 60 years and counting. All of us at the foundation work hard to raise funds to support Stanford Healthcare Valley Cares programs and services because we know Every contribution could literally be a lifesaver. You have more information about the Women in Need Fund, both how to donate to it and how it's helped patients, as well as how to access it if you are a patient who needs access to the funds on your chairs. Um, so please join me in thanking Edith again for sharing her story, and thank you for having us tonight. Um, I think as we had mentioned initially, it's not just the comprehensive care that we provide, but that care is provided irrespective of a patient's financial background. So that's where Women in Need Fund comes in handy. And um, I think another round of applause, 577 women right in our community helped by this fund. So we're actually going to go to um, the door prizes. Actually, I'm going to have Edith pick the winning ticket. Thank you. 
So let's see who's the lucky winner. 1103829. Yes. Okay, we'll have Edith pick another one. Maybe that table is going to get lucky. One one zero three nine zero four. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. So our third raffle ticket is one one zero three eight nine zero. Okay, so we're going to pull a fourth one and then actually, given in the interest of time, we'll continue actually with the agenda. So the next one is 1103861. Yes, congratulations. So moving on with the next talk, um, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing Dr. Kavita Raj. She's a dual board certified general oncologist and hematologist with expertise in breast cancer. She completed her fellowship in hematology, oncology, and cancer prevention at UC Irvine, and has been in the community practice um, here in the Tri-Valley since 2010. She's been the recipient of numerous awards, including the American Society of Clinical Oncology Merit Award, and the American Association of Cancer Research Susan G. Komen Scholar in Training Award for her work in colon cancer and breast cancer. Dr. Raj is committed to helping and guiding her patients as they navigate to their most difficult journey, that is the diagnosis of cancer. She's known by her patients, their families, and her colleagues for her strong sense of empathy and compassion. Dr. Raj believes in bringing hope to her patients' lives in improving patient outcomes by providing comprehensive and personalized cancer care. Um, she will be talking about getting it right, latest advances in breast cancer. I have the privilege of working with her on a daily basis. She's my partner in crime, Dr. Raj. All right, can you hear me? Thank you, Rishi, for such a nice introduction. And um, greeting everyone. I, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces. I'm quite happy to see a lot of familiar faces. And uh, I have to say this, this is an exciting time to be um, talking about breast cancer advances because breast cancer care is essentially going through a revolution. What we know about breast cancer in the last decade is more than what we have known about this cancer ever. Um, and uh, you know, we talk about precision medicine and personalized cancer care. What actually that means is, you know, starting at the level of the DNA and working towards the person as a whole person and essentially matching the right therapy to the right tumor. That's all precision medicine is. And we're able to cure so many women with less toxicities. And... Um, The cancer mortality in U.S. continues to drop, and uh, we, if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer in this decade, her risk of dying from breast cancer is almost 40% less compared to in the 90s, not too long ago. In just this last decade, we have done like so well in terms of decreasing cancer mortality. But we still have breast cancer leaves a huge mark in the society. Uh, it, is, it is still actually a very common, most common cancer in women, and it's still the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths in women. As you see, there is a 14% mortality rate out of that 
5% is triple negative, which is one of the more aggressive type of cancers. And uh, when, we, when I was asked to give this talk, because it's such a vast area, and I was thinking, what am I going to talk about in like 15 minutes, right? And essentially, the theme of where we're going, that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, the theme is actually getting it right, right? We talked about that 14% mortality rate and 5% is triple negative. Essentially, what that means is uh, 9 out of 100 women who are being diagnosed with breast cancer is at risk for dying. How can we identify those 9 women? and treat them aggressively so that they don't die from the breast cancer? How can we spare the 91 women from aggressive therapies that they don't need, right? That is actually the theme, and it is striking the right balance for every woman. And it's whatever we do in life, it's all about risk versus benefits, right? And this is what we do in our office day in and out, looking at someone's risk of re recurrence and looking at toxicity and making the right decision for them. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about how breast cancer has evolved. Um, when I was a resident, I mean, it feels like zillion years ago, but was only 15 years ago. I used to say when someone asked me, what is this person has? I would say, well, they have a stage one breast cancer, stage two breast cancer. Breast cancer was viewed as one disease. Now, not like that anymore. It is a family of diseases. We have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, progesterone negative breast cancer, we have the luminal A, luminal B, we have the HER2 positive, we have triple negative, we have BRCA-like. So it is, it is very uh, different type of diseases together. So I call it as a family of diseases and it's not one disease anymore. And you, you heard from um, the surgeons about uh, you know, excellent treatment options available for women with uh, uh, breast cancer. So a lot of times when I see someone in my office, they've already had their surgery for someone with early stage breast cancer, and I'm telling them, great, the cancer has been removed, and you have negative margins, and then I'm telling them, oh, by the way, we're going to do this. You're going to get radiation, you're going to get chemotherapy, anti-estrogen therapy. A lot of times they're like, hold on a second, you just said that my cancer is removed. Why do I need to get all these treatments, right? And um, the analogy that I like to give is uh, cancer is like a weed, right? We need to pull the weed completely, and uh, that is surgery, scooping out the tumor with the negative margins. And, in the, and we may have to do a little weed spray. I mean, not to minimize what doc, Dr. Trickle does. <laughs> we need to do a little weed spray to make sure the weed doesn't grow back there, right? And sometimes these weeds are those, you know, not good looking weed. They can have those yellow fluffy seed and they can fly away even before we're able to remove the weed. And uh, we worried about the weed coming back in a different part of the lawn. You're worried about the cancer coming back in a different part of the body. So those women may need the big roundup, right? They may need the chemotherapy. And uh, there are some women who are going to need anti-estrogen therapy. A lot of times I'm telling my women who are postmenopausal and who are telling me like, well, I already feel like dry like a bone and I'm having hot flashes. What estrogen are you going to block? I have none, right? And um, women not only make estrogen in their ovaries, they make estrogen in their fat cells. So that's what we block to prevent the cancer from growing. And we have HER2 blockers. There are about 15 to 20% of the time cancer is promoted by this protein called the HER2 protein, and we have a way to block it. So I am going to mostly here talk about the treatment for the body, right? And uh, you heard from the surgeons, what is the theme? Actually doing less is actually more. That is the theme. Uh, how we have gone from you know, radical mastectomies to nice breast conserving therapy. And the same theme you're going to hear from Dr. Trickle as well, how we have gone from longer courses of radiation to shorter courses, how were we even thinking about maybe omitting radiation in some women? Why is it so important, right? This is why it is important. It causes a lot of side effects. I remember uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was a medical student, we saw a lot of women with disabling lymphedema. It doesn't make any sense to cure someone's cancer and leave them with 
you know, disabling lymphedema for their entire life. And that's why we need to do better. So when I think about what is that we want to achieve when we treat someone with breast cancer, we want to prevent women from dying from breast cancer. That's what we want, right? And um, how we talked about, you know, we want to aggressively treat those nine out of 100 women, right? How are we going to identify those women to treat them aggressively? And, uh, you know, we have many ways of knowing who needs chemotherapy. We look at their size of the tumor. We look at their lymph node. We look at their grade, estrogen, HER2. There are a lot of things we look at. But at the same time, we are not always able to 100% predict who is going to relapse, who needs the chemotherapy. That's when this genomic assays came in. We've been using them for the past 10 years now. Uh, there are two you know, uh, tests. One is Oncotype, the other one is Mammaprint. This is a study that is done on Oncotype test. And we have known all along if a woman has a low risk on the Oncotype. Oncotype is what it is, is it's looking at different gene expressions on a particular woman's tumor. It's not looking at anyone with stage two or stage one breast cancer. It is precisely for that woman. And when we do this test, it gives a scorecard, right? It gave a low risk, intermediate risk, and a high risk. We knew if someone had low risk, they didn't need chemotherapy. We knew if someone had high risk, they needed chemotherapy. But what about this intermediate risk? We're like back to square one, right? And this was the study that was published last year, which looked at women with intermediate risk and said, these women do not benefit from chemotherapy. If I am the doctor who is giving the news to my patient, or if you are the patient, there is a big difference between me telling you that, well, you may benefit from little chemotherapy versus you don't benefit from it at all, right? So this study um, is important because we're using newer chemotherapy regimens, we're using newer anti-estrogen therapy. I think it is important to tell our women with, uh, um, you know, such a good precision and prediction that they don't need chemotherapy, especially if we're going to, you know, tell them they don't need chemotherapy, you better be right, right? So that's what this study is about. Um, and uh, younger women may not be a candidate for this test because we saw some chemotherapy benefit in these women. Um, so your doctor may not think that you're a candidate for this uh, test. And we're not so sure why this uh, benefit we're seeing. Is it because what happens if I give chemotherapy to someone who's having regular period, their ovaries are functioning? the chemo is going to suppress their ovaries. Uh, and the question is, is the benefit that we're seeing, is it due to the chemo suppressing the hormones? Or is it really a chemo benefit? We don't know yet. Until then, this test, we're able to do it for all postmenopausal women, and we're able to you know, avoid chemotherapy in almost 70% of women who are being diagnosed with breast cancer, which is great. And we're able to apply this test for even in women with node positive disease. And um, NCCN guidelines allows us to use it up to four lymph nodes positive, which is great. What that means is the biology of the tumor is more important than the size or the lymph node and, and anything. So the next question, you know, okay, we did the surgery. We have decided on the chemotherapy. We have put the woman on anti-estrogen therapy. Well, the next question is, how long should I give them anti-estrogen therapy? I have to say, in the last 10 years, we've gone back and forth between five versus 10 years because there will be a study that comes and says, yes, everybody benefits from it. And then the next year, there will be a study that says, mm, maybe not, right? So there are a lot of studies kind of back and forth. We're st still not sure who benefits from what. So far, what we know is upfront tamoxifen followed by aromatase inhibitors has shown consistent benefit and uh, there was a meta-analysis that was presented uh, this year. This combined all the studies that has been done on this five versus 10 years question. And what they found was women who had node involvement benefited from taking the anti-estrogen therapy longer. And uh, also, they were able to do this test called the breast cancer index testing like how we have the oncotype and the mammoprint for deciding on chemotherapy, we have a test called breast cancer index testing, which we can do 
to kind of decide who needs that five years versus 10 years. It is not the standard of care yet, but we're trying to get clues from small studies and trying to use this test in some of the women. Um, and why is it so important? Can we give everybody 10 years of anti-estrogen therapy, right? Uh, if you're taking this pill in this crowd, you will know it's not an easy pill. It causes fatigue, it causes achiness in the bones, it causes hot flashes, it causes bone density loss. In some women, it can also put them at risk for cardiovascular disease in the long run. So there is still continued research needed in this field, but at least I think we're kind of gauging who needs five years versus who needs 10 years, right? Now the next thing is um, how can we diagnose these women? There are um, half of the time when relapse happens, it happens after five years, right? And we have a lot of fancy imaging tools. We have MRIs, we have PET scans. We have really good tools of detecting cancer early. We can detect cancer even if it is a one centimeter tiny, tiny tumor. But you know how many cancer cells will it take to make this tiny dot in the scan? It takes 100 million cancer cells, okay? When, even when you're seeing something early on a scan and it's a bone or the lung or the liver, we're already really you know, behind in the game because it's already set up a shop in a different place of the body. The question is, well, can we detect the cancer earlier, maybe when it is 100 cells, maybe when it is 10 cells? If we can do that, that would be wonderful, right? And because we can prevent stage four breast cancer. We can cure these women before we're able to see the cancer on a scan. There is a test called circulating tumor DNA. What this is, is it's a simple blood test. And we can identify the DNA that gets released from the dying cancer cells. And we can stain it. We can say, is it estrogen positive? Is it HER2 positive? And we can give women treatment that's, even, that's not even chemotherapy and possibly prevent someone having a stage four cancer later on. There's a lot of optimism in this test. It's not for prime time yet, but my feeling is in another five, 10 years from now, scans will be obsolete and we'll be doing these type of tests to follow women to prevent stage four breast cancer. And um, moving on to triple negative breast cancer, like I mentioned before, triple negative breast cancer is still a big challenge because it's one of the very aggressive cancers. It's a bad biology. We're trying to figure out what actually drives this cancer. It's not the estrogen, it's not the HER2. What is actually driving this cancer, right? And uh, a lot of times I get asked this question, how about immunotherapy, right? I used to tell my patients when they ask me this question, especially in the breast cancer world, I, I used to say, well, breast cancer is not that immunogenic. It's not like other cancers. We don't use immunotherapy, but I'm wrong. Now we have identified a subgroup of patients with triple negative breast cancer. About 60% of women with triple negative breast cancer has an expression they will respond to, to immunotherapy. And this study showed almost doubling of the survival rate uh, in such an aggressive stage for triple negative breast cancer. And what is immunotherapy, right? We, you know, we know what chemotherapy is, we know what anti-estrogen therapy is. We have white cells in the body, the T cells. The T cells are like the cops of our body. When you have a virus or a bacteria, they know that it is a foreign body and goes and attacks it. What the cancer cell does is it's pretty smart. It kind of wears a mask saying that, well, I, am, I belong here, I'm not a foreign cell, and kind of fools your T cells. And the T cells goes and minds its own business while the cancer cells you know, divide and multiply. Now we have a way to identify that and kind of unleash your immune system to fight off the cancer cells. That is what immunotherapy is. And with triple negative breast cancers in an early stage, we give chemotherapy now. We have a clinical trial at Stanford looking at immunotherapy in these women if they have any residual cancer after their chemotherapy. So I expect these, some of the results will be presented later this year at San Antonio. So next year, we may be treating these women with triple negative cancer 
somewhat differently so that you know, they don't end up in that 5% that we talk about. Also in triple negative breast cancers, 12 to 15% of the time, we see a BRCA mutation, meaning those cancers are due to this gene condition. And we have a pill called PARP inhibitor. We have two pills, and we can give to these women. And these women, especially if they have a triple negative breast cancer, their, their survival is very dismal in terms of stage four cancer for them to have this pill, and this pill can penetrate the blood-brain barrier, meaning women with, you know, even brain cancer in a setting like this will respond beautifully to these pills, and I have patients on these pills, they are going about their lives, traveling, enjoying time with their family, not getting chemotherapy, and this is very good for these women. Um, this is essentially studying the biology of the cancer to find out what can we do to target some of these cancers. In the interest of the time, I think I'm going to move through the HER2. Um, HER2 is, I call it as a disease of the past. We have conquered HER2. I remember I was a resident when the first adjuvant HER2 trial came in, and I think it was 2005. And from then, look at the laundry list of uh, HER2 blockers. We have excellent, excellent HER2 blocking treatment. I have to say, in the last 10 years of practicing breast oncology, I have never lost a woman for HER2 disease. Even women with stage four HER2 positive breast cancers are living longer and longer and longer like it is a chronic disease. That is how great we're doing with HER2 positive disease. And uh, we are not, just, you know, we're looking at, can we give these drugs to women who are not HER2 positive, but maybe benefit from it? That's what's going on. So let me skip that. The last part of my talk is MBC, okay? And uh, a few months ago, uh, I was getting ready to come to work. It was early in the morning. I'm getting calls from the hospital, attending my calls. My engineer husband, who has a lot more time than I do, he's sipping his coffee, watching his news, and then I'm running around. He asked me, do you know what MBC is? I'm like, I thought for a second, oh, this is a quiz. I better answer this question right. Otherwise, he's going to go into, you doctors don't know anything. So um, I said, what? Is it metastatic breast cancer? He's like, yeah, you're right. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know, with the ads on TV. I always wonder, why are they spending all this money on TV ads? The doctor knows what is the right thing for the patient. But this is one area I thought it's very interesting. In stage four breast cancer or metastatic breast cancer, we're essentially wanting to take the cancer word away from the disease because that's how People are doing great. It is a chronic disease. I tell my patients, it's like high blood pressure, cholesterol. For a long period of time, you're going to be taking these pills. And it will be 10 years before you need chemotherapy on most of our patients. And this is a slide I used five years ago uh, that showed what are the treatment options available for MBC. We had the tamoxifen, aromatase inhibitors, Faslodex. Now, the slide looks a lot different. We have the new kind of drugs called the CDK4-6 inhibitors. That is the Ibrans, Verzinio, the Ribociclib. There are three drugs that are approved and that has changed the landscape of how we view the metastatic breast cancer. The recent studies from European Society of Oncology that was presented earlier this month shows deeper, deeper remission in these women when we combine these pills with anti-estrogen pills. They go in remission for five to 10 years. And we're also seeing that these drugs may work even in a HER2 setting, even in a triple negative setting, because these drugs are immunogenic. There is one of the drugs called Verzinio. It can cause even the blood-brain barrier. So we're so excited. We have our mTOR inhibitor. We have the Afinitor. And we talked about the PARP inhibitors. And um, we have so many drugs that are coming in pipeline. This year, there was a drug that was approved called the PIK3 kinase inhibitor. 40% of women with breast cancer will have this mutation. Now we're able to target this mutation. And there are a lot of anti-estrogen therapies that are under 
studies. There is a novel estrogen receptor blocker. So there is a lot more to come. If I have to give this talk 10 years from now, this slide is going to be a lot busier slide. We'll have a lot of tools in our pocket. I think we already talked about that. We're still not sure how to sequence these drugs. We're still working on it because when I say this is a chronic disease, I really want my patient to feel like a chronic disease, not have side effects, right? We got to really work hard at that. That's what we're working on right now. And um, um, DCIS is the last one. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it. You know, to conclude, I think we have done excellent in, uh, you know, in the world of uh, breast cancer, especially early stage breast cancer. I even think it's, 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 you know, to put this in perspective, isn't this like wonderful to even talk about, you know, de-escalating treatment? Maybe we're over-treating some women compared to how many women we lost, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, or 50 years ago. So I think we are, a, you know, it's a luxury to even talk about it. And, uh, you know, as we go along in this path, like Dr. Lee said, I think we want it just right. I got the Goldilocks too. <laughs> Thank you. So our next talk is actually by uh, Dr. Trekul. Dr. Trekul is an assistant professor in the Department of Radiation Oncology at Stanford. He's the medical director of Radiation Oncology Stanford at Pleasanton. He completed his residency training in Stanford and was a faculty member at the University of Southern California prior to his current position. His primary goal is to make compassionate, comprehensive, and modern radiation therapy available and accessible to his patients in the East Bay. Dr. Trekul will be talking about the role of radiotherapy in the management of regional lymphatics in breast cancer. Um, Dr. Trekul has been an asset to our program. He joined us three years ago. Um, and along with myself and Dr. Raj, we are the three amigos that can be found in Pleasanton. So, welcome. Thank you. So, I'm a radiation oncologist. Dr. Sani did a great job introducing me. And radiation oncology is a bit of an obscure area of medicine. Uh, my own father-in-law, who's a doctor, uh, thought that I was a radiologist for about two years before he figured out that it's a completely separate specialty altogether. So I'm going to introduce a little bit uh, of the basics of radiation before I get into uh, some uh, clinical data. Um, radiation, therapeutic radiation that we use for breast cancer, they're x-rays. They're no different from the x-rays used in a mammogram or a chest x-ray. But they're higher energy x-ray, so they are in the megavolt range. That's millions of volts as opposed to the kilovolt range, which is what we use for uh, standard x-rays. Um, the, the reason that they're more energetic, it allows them to penetrate more deeply into the body and get to areas where uh, lower energy x-rays would not be able to get to. The unit of radiation is, uh, radiation dose is the gray, G-R-A-Y. It's named after a long dead English physicist uh, who uh, described the radiation dose. And if you're interested in the uh, SI units of the gray, it's one joule per kilogram. Ra how does radiation work? Radiation damages DNA. It damages the DNA of any cell it passes through. Uh, normal cell, cancer cell, any cell. It just uh, damages DNA by directly interacting with the chemical structure of DNA and causing breaks in the double helix or interacting with water, which is what is surrounding the DNA uh, and forming uh, uh, oxidized radicals, which then interact with the DNA and break the double helix. And I tell people that uh, radiation kills cancer cells, but it doesn't kill normal cells, even though it damages normal cells. And people will ask, well, how does that work? Um, and it's simple. Uh, so imagine, to use an analogy, imagine you have a child, and this child has a room, and this room is full of toys, and every day you tell your child to go into his room and play with his toys, and you come back two hours later. The, the room's gonna be messy, right? The child's gonna cause some damage. And if you're a normal parent, if you're a good parent or a normal cell, you're gonna tell your child to clean up his room. Or more likely, in my experience, you're gonna end up cleaning the room yourself. But regardless, the room is gonna get cleaned. 
and a normal cell will repair all the damage caused by radiation before it tries to divide again. A cancer cell will not do this. It's not a good parent. It's only interested in one thing, creating more cancer cells. So it doesn't stop to repair the damage. It, it lets the kid go to sleep and play in the room the next day without picking up his toys. And it starts having more kids and putting those kids in the room and letting them play with those toys. And eventually, the room becomes uninhabitable. And the cancer cell becomes so damaged that it can't do the normal things it needs to do to be a cell. And it dies. And that's how radiation works to kill cancer cells, but doesn't kill normal cells by and large. So how do we use radiation in breast cancer? We use it as an adjuvant treatment. By definition, an adjuvant treatment is treatment with no visible or present disease. So we're treating patients where all the disease has been removed. And we're treating them as sort of an insurance policy. I say we're treating you to clean up after the surgeons, even though they're great and they did a good job and everything's gone. We can never be 100% certain. Uh, Dr. Lai doesn't have a microscope when she's doing your uh, surgery, and she doesn't know that there's not one breast cancer cell left behind. And if we do nothing, that one breast cancer cell will eventually form a tumor again, and we're right back where we started from. We don't want that. Radiation improves local regional control. And what do I mean by that? I've got a picture of a breast with some lymph nodes. Uh, lymph nodes uh, run along the lymph vessels, which parallel the blood vessels. And uh, breast cancer cells start in the breast, and they travel through the lymphatic vessels, through the lymph nodes in the axilla, the armpit, uh, up to the lymph nodes of the, around the clavicle. And in the middle of the chest, there's a chain of lymph nodes called the internal mammary nodes, uh, which uh, most breast cancers don't go to, but ones that are more medial or closer to the center, midline of the body, can. And so what radiation does is uh, kills microscopic cancer cells wherever there's a risk of microscopic cancer cells, whether it be in the breast or in any of those lymph nodes. So when we talk about local control, I'm talking about the breast. When I'm talking about regional control, I'm talking about the draining lymph nodes. And distant control is everywhere else, and that's Dr. Raj's department. Although radiation is increasingly used to enhance distant control, um, and that may be something I talk about in, next time. Uh, the types of radiation that we standardly do, we treat the whole breast with radiation. We can also do partial breast irradiation. We can treat the chest wall if you don't have a breast after a mastectomy. And we can do regional nodal irradiation, which is treatment of the breast and chest wall along with all those lymph nodes or many of those lymph nodes. So when I was here last in 2017, I talked about early stage breast cancer, stage one breast cancer. These are small tumors, no lymph nodes. And Dr. Raj said less is more. It, more accurate way to say it would be less is enough. So the standard treatment would be, was 50 gray and 25 fractions, five weeks of radiation, sometimes six weeks of radiation. That's what we did for a long time. Uh, and then studies emerged that showed that 40 gray and 15 fractions is just as good. And for some women, 38.5 gray and 10 fractions given over five days, twice a day, is also good if your risk is low. And zero gray and zero fractions, uh, which is uh, the best type of radiation, is uh, appropriate for some very low risk patients. And these, all this came out of studies based in uh, Canada and the United Kingdom. Uh, these countries have national healthcare systems. They're very interested in not wasting medical resources, which is something we're uh, starting to learn about over here in the United States. Um, but as you can see, this has been adopted in the United States, and now I have not treated a patient with stage one breast cancer over six weeks um, since I came here to Pleasanton. Uh, the reason why is because uh, eventually uh, people who do find themselves mentioned in the New York Times. And since radiation oncology is such a small field of medicine, we hardly ever get into the New York Times. And when we do, it's never for anything good. It's always for something like this. Um, but anyway, this has sort of spurred this change, and now we've more or less adopted as a field shorter course radiation for early stage breast cancer. But what about node positive breast cancer? Or this is stage two and three breast cancer. Well, here the opposite thing has occurred. We're doing more radiation in these women than we did when I was a resident in training. Uh, and so is more and more? Are we being more aggressive with the radiation? Are we trying to make up the money we're losing on short course radiation and early stage breast cancer by treating patients with stage two and three breast cancer with more radiation? It's not exactly what's going on. So let, here's an example of how this whole paradigm has shifted. 
uh, back, this is, this is not too long ago. This is when I was a resident, um, which is not too long ago. Still, hopefully, yes. Um, if you had a sentinel lymph node positive, you got axillary lymph node dissection surgically. Now, as Dr. Lai mentioned in her talk, if you have a sentinel lymph node positive, you just get a sentinel lymph node biopsy. That's it. Uh, any women who had a node positive got chemotherapy. That was, that's how I easily remembered who got chemotherapy and who didn't. If you had a node positive, you needed chemo. Now, it depends on your oncotype score. For regional nodal radiation, that's radiating all the lymph nodes. We had, you know, the two things you remember, four lymph nodes or more, or a tumor greater than five centimeter, you needed regional nodal radiation. Now, we do it for women with even one lymph node positive, or even high risk, no negative women will do regional nodal radiation on. The internal mammary nodes, those nodes down in the middle of the chest, never treated them, never saw it done, didn't know how to do it. Now we treat them almost all the time. Um, and it's, we can talk about uh, why that is in a, in a minute. So what happened? What happened? Let's go back to the, our, our New York Times, the esteemed scientific uh, source of information. Dr. Raj mentioned that a lot of women with breast cancer aren't getting chemo. And Dr. Lai mentioned that a lot of women aren't getting axillary lymph node dissections. So what has happened is that radiation has kind of filled the void um, where women are not getting surgery, not getting as much chemo, but they are getting more radiation. So it's not like we're treating more, we're just sort of treating them differently. And that's what's really changed. And radiation is kind of the, the modality that's kind of stepped into the, the areas that were left by the other two. Okay, Dr. Lai talked about these two studies, so I'm not going to uh, belabor them. ACOSOG Z11 and Amaros. Essentially, bottom line here is that uh, if you're node positive on a sentinel lymph node biopsy, radiation can kind of cover for the axillary lymph node dissection. That's the, the take-home point there. So radiation can make up for having all or many lymph nodes taken out of the axilla. And what's, why that's good is because with Radiation, you get less lymphedema. So the lymphedema rates in the Amaro's trial were 23% with the axial lymph node dissection versus 11% with surgery. And that, the impact of that has been felt uh, tremendously. Uh, this is a uh, study from the Netherlands uh, looking at the rates of axillary lymph node dissection through time. You can see it's dropping. Same thing's happening here in the United States. Dr. Lai says she doesn't do axillary lymph node dissections anymore hardly. That's been my experience with a lot of people. You hardly ever see it. So what about radiation? Uh, does it provide benefits other than not causing lymphedema? And the first indication that this was the case in women who had just even one lymph node involved came from the early breast uh, cancer trialist collaborative group. Uh, people call this the Oxford meta-analysis to sort of avoid that acronym. Um, this is a group that takes a bunch of uh, trials and sort of combines them together to form what's known as a meta-analysis. And it's, it's powerful in that you get tons of patients. Um, and so you can kind of uh, sort of look for large trends. And the trend that was seen uh, in this most recent update, which goes out to 20 years, is that uh, when for women with one to three lymph nodes positive, Radiation reduced the risk of cancer coming back by about 16%, and over 20 years, it reduced the risk of dying of breast cancer by about 8%. So those are pretty impressive numbers, and um, uh, you would think that, okay, so we should be doing radiation everybody, but there's a caveat in that it's old chemotherapy. Chemotherapy we don't use anymore. So one could argue that, well, if we use more modern chemotherapy, those, no, those, that difference wouldn't be as big. So radiation really doesn't do that much. It can only cover for uh, bad chemotherapy, which is a valid point. So two more recent trials were done that sort of support this, uh, the use of radiation therapy to treat the regional nodes in women with uh, limited numbers of lymph nodes. And it's MA20 from Canada and the URTC2292, which is from Europe. Um, and these are women who had one to three nodes uh, or even high risk node negative women in MA20. They all had axillary lymph node dissections after breast conservation surgery. And they were given, half of them were just given whole breast, the other half were given whole breast plus regional nodes. Similar thing was done in this EORTC trial. And these are the numbers for both. So as you might expect, the difference is not as large as, the, as the sh was shown in the Oxford meta-analysis because chemo is better and chemo does control 
the regional lymph nodes. We know that's true because uh, we give chemo before surgery and we see that the lymph nodes often are negative after uh, getting chemo. But there is still a significant decrease in uh, disease-free survival by about 5% and a uh, significant uh, survival benefit of about 2%. And the good thing is that the URTC trial and the MA20 trial showed about the same thing, uh, about a 3 to 5% uh, increase in chance that you're going to be cured from cancer in 10 years and about a 2% less risk of dying. So that's what radiation to the regional nodes gets you. So would you say that's worth it, 5% chance of being cured, 2% 2 less chance of being, died, of being dead from breast cancer? A lot of people would say yes, but what does that cost? Um, because there's a cost to everything, and radiation is no different. But the cost of radiation is getting less as we get better at doing it. So the main problem with radiation in the older trials is that a lot of women developed heart problems, uh, atherosclerotic heart disease, many years after radiation. Um, and we know that that's, someone did a study and worked it out that it's about 7.4% uh, per gray mean heart dose uh, increases your risk of having a cardiac problem later in life. Our typical mean heart dose now with our modern uh, treatment techniques is about uh, 200 centigrade, which is increasing your risk by about 2%. The data from the MA20, uh, that trial from Canada that included all the regional nodes, showed that uh, you increase your chance of having a lung problem, that's either radiation pneumonia or fibrosis of the lung, by about 1% with radiation, and the risk of lymphedema was increased by about 4%. But you should keep in mind that these numbers, 8.4% and 4.5%, were all done with axillary lymph node dissections, not with just sentinel lymph node biopsy. So you can probably cut them in half in the sentinel lymph node biopsies, as we do here. Why has radiation gotten better? Because we've just gotten better at doing it. So this is uh, what we would typically do. Uh, this is a regional nodal radiation plan. You can see the the rainbow colors are the radiation. Um, and this is a left-sided uh, uh, treatment plan. And what we typically do for women with left-sided breast cancer is have them hold their breath deeply during treatment. What this does, as you can see on these scans, is that it pulls the heart down into the middle of the chest, and that gets it away from the chest wall where the radiation is going. The three principles of radiation safety, or how you reduce your radiation exposure, are time, distance, and shielding. We can't do anything about the time. We need to treat to the dose. Uh, we can't put a shield in between the heart and the, the chest wall, but we can do something about distance. And that distance, this distance makes a huge difference in reducing the radiation dose to the heart. So having said all this, who gets nodal radiation? Who do we do nodal radiation for in the present day and age? So you've had breast surgery, you've got one sentinel lymph node positive, uh, Oncotype score somewhere in the middle. Well, it's complicated now, isn't it? Because there's a lot of like nuance that goes into this decision. And you can see this complicated tree over here, which you don't have to look at, but it just shows you all the things that we sort of consider. So we consider how risky is this patient? How likely is there to be micro metastatic disease in the axillary lymph nodes? Um, what's their hormone receptor status? If they're hormone negative, then they won't benefit from hormonal treatment. So we should try to make up for that with radiation. How many nodes were there? What, what was the size of the nodes? Uh, was there uh, a lymphovascular invasion? These are all things that we sort of go through in the, the pathology report and sort of check off to see um, exactly what your risk is. The oncotype score, so it kind of works both ways. If your oncotype score is really high, that means you've got an aggressive breast cancer and I should cover that with radiation. If your oncotype score is low, you're not gonna get chemotherapy. So there, no one's really doing anything about the micrometastatic disease in the axilla if you're not getting chemo, so then we may need radiation too. Um, and we can also sort of hedge things a little bit. So this is what we call high tangent treatment. This is where we just treat the lymph nodes of the axilla, but we don't swing around to get the superclav nodes. We don't go into the middle of the chest to get the internal mammary nodes. And as you can see, this reduces the dose to the lung by a lot because we're not coming across the top uh, field of the lung there to get those higher nodes. And a lot of women, maybe that's overkill to treat so many nodes. So what's gonna happen next? Uh, we're gonna end up eventually hypofractionating this regional nodal treatment. We still do the classic 50 gray and 25 fractions, so it's still five to six weeks for these women. But um, I've done it uh, over three or four weeks, and it seems to work, but we just have to wait for 
um, longer term data because it's a larger radiation field. So the risk of radiation injury is higher. Um, and then a lot of these women are getting uh, chemotherapy before surgery. And so this is great because this allows us a way to assess in vivo whether the chemotherapy is good or whether it worked or not. And so the question is going to be, how do we manage these patients? And there's two large trials ongoing right now. Um, one is looking for women who have a complete response uh, to the pre-op chemotherapy and whether we should give them just whole breast radiation or whether we should include the nodes. And there's another surgical trial looking at women who don't respond completely and whether they need surgery or regional nodal radiation. So this is essentially like repeating amaros in the neoadjuvant setting. Okay, thank you for listening to me. I also, before you, I don't want to interrupt you guys, but I also want to say thank you to my radiation oncology team who are sitting over there. I've worked in a few places, and I can say they are the best at what they do, top to bottom. And anyone, who, and I know there's a few people that have passed through our department, can testify that they are great, and they are what makes us great. So thanks. Okay, so um, as we move ahead, we'll open up to questions. Um, so for questions, we have, um, uh, you know, mics that will be passed around while that is being done. Uh, on your uh, tables are, uh, there's a very important piece of paper. That's the feedback form. We want to make sure that you uh, give us feedback. Um, last year's feedback is what decided on the agenda for this year. Every year we take your feedback into account. Topics, speakers, food, wine, everything is open for, for feedback. So um, please let us know. Um, and then I'll invite actually the panelists to come up and then we'll open up for questions. Hi, Dr. Yi, I have a question regarding tomothesis. Is, the inner, is lobular cancer also equally detected as ductal? in that procedure? Invasive lobular cancer can be very hard to detect. It's slow growing, and generally the first signs are architectural distortion, which is better seen with tomosynthesis. Okay, and uh, Dr. Raj, I have a question. You know, with the uh, treatments that are there today and the side effects that we've seen, for people who have those side effects, is there any treatments now to reduce or to treat the side effects that you receive from earlier treatments? Yes, we do. Um, our supportive care treatment has tremendously improved compared to what we did 20 years ago. We gave aggressive chemotherapies and people were, you know, having so much of nausea and vomiting. These days we have excellent anti-nausea medications and I tell my patients nobody's throwing up on our watch now. That's how good our nausea medications have become. We have the cold cap now, 60% of women who get breast cancer treatment. Um, they're able to retain their hair. They may have hair thinning, but that is an advantage. I mean, that is an advance. So supportive care treatment is equally getting better like the treatment is getting advancing, yeah. Um, my name's Julie. I'm a lymphedema and breast cancer physical therapist. Um, I have a question for Dr. Perro. Um, I was just wondering, in your experience, do you find better aesthetic and long-term results from um, autologist um, reconstruction versus implants? That's a great question. Um, it depends a on a lot of factors, including whether you're doing one breast or two. Um, it is very difficult to get good symmetry with a one-sided implant reconstruction and a, a natural breast on the other side without doing something to the other side. Um, there are some studies that suggest that long-term patient satisfaction with the autologous or your body's own tissue is higher than certain implant reconstructions. There are some um, limitations of those studies, so it's a little bit hard to say, um, but a really well done autologous reconstruction is a very nice natural result for women. Um, but it, there's so many factors because it, you got to have enough tummy tissue to reconstruct a breast that you, uh, of a size that the patient wants. And so um, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So each one really is nuanced. I think that any surgeon that really has one approach and that's what they do 95% of the time 
is probably not giving the true breadth of options available to that individual patient. So I think that you should be seeing someone that does a, a variety of them based on each situation. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. Please. Um, um, do you have much experience with capsular contractions and how often do those occur and what can be done like to prevent or yeah, that's a great question. So it was about capsular contracture, which for people that are unfamiliar with the term is kind of scar tissue that forms around a breast implant um, and can get kind of firm and hard with time. So any device in the body forms a capsule or scar tissue around it. Sometimes that scar tissue can get firm. It happens in splinters and pacemakers and anything that's in the body. But a breast implant is designed to be squishy and soft and not feel hard and firm. And so um, with time, the rates of capsular contracture go up. And that is one of the reasons that um, implants may need to be revised in the future. The rates of which that develops vary based on women, and they are getting better as we have better techniques to sort of avoid it in the operating room. But I tell women that an implant is not designed to be a lifelong device. There's this rule of thumb that maybe every 10 years or so something will have to be done for them. That's based on kind of voodoo numbers, and so it's not exactly that. I have women that go m much longer than that without needing anything, but I think it's important to know if you're deciding between the two choices and you're a candidate for both, that implants are not designed to last forever, and at some point they'll likely need to be touched up. I had a question regarding, uh, for average risk, risk women, what are the current recommendations for your mammography, TOMO, um, the imaging needs? Yeah, so we recommend yearly screening beginning at age 40 for average risk women. Uh, generally for heterogeneously dense or denser breasts, TOMO synthesis does offer better detection. Uh, I have a question uh, concerning the uh, radiation. Uh, for the whole breast irradiation together with the regional lymph radiation, do you see more patients complaining about the breast lymphedema? Lymphedema of the breast itself? Yes. yes. Um, I would suspect that it's probably a little bit more um, uh, prevalent because on. It's probably a little bit more prevalent because the regional nodes uh, are affect, you know, they scarring in the axillary area can cause breast lymphedema in addition to lymphedema of the arm. So that's something that we see. So lymphedema risk is higher whenever we uh, treat regional nodes, whether it be in the arm or the breast or anything. But those numbers overall are, like I said, quite small and getting smaller uh, every year. So probably less than 5%. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I do one have another question about the uh, uh, plastic surgery. Uh, for the uh, implant, uh, would you uh, discuss about the chance of uh, lymphoma after the uh, texture type implant? And also for the uh, fat graphing, uh, do you think that there is an increased risk of breast cancer recurrence after the fat graphing? There were two questions there. One, we'll do the first one, which was asking about a um, rare type of lymphoma that has been associated with certain types of implants. So um, I didn't go into all of the different types of breast implants, but they can be round or they can be shaped, they can be smooth or they can be textured. Texturing is a, dev is a way that implants were treated so that they didn't rotate and they actually were there originally to help decrease capsular contracture, which was what one of the other questions was about. There has been a poorly understood but increasingly like detected thing called breast um uh, breast implant associated ALCL, it's a subtype of lymphoma that has formed as like a fluid that builds up around certain types of textured breast implants. Um, and textured breast implants were common in breast reconstruction because we used in the past a lot of anatomically shaped implants that were less full up top and more full in the bottom because it had sort of a teardrop shape, which a lot of women liked. Um, it got to the point as we were studying it that one type of texturing had higher rates of that than other implants, and it was specifically something from the company called Allergan um, that were actually recently, you may have seen in the news, recalled, not meaning that they needed to be removed. That's still not their recommendation, but they're no longer 
sold. Um, and it was just that company's texturing that seemed to be associated with a slightly higher rate of this kind of poorly understood lymphoma than others. For that reason, I don't, I don't use a lot of textured implants. There are a handful of situations where I discuss with women about it. Um, I think the incidence is getting less and less um, because anything that, that can be associated with it is low. I will say that I've had a number of patients that do have textured implants that come and talk to me about this news and this development. Um, and I don't universally recommend that they replace them because it is... For people that are aware of it, it prevents or presents as kind of one-sided swelling around an implant and is very um, easy to detect and then easy to treat. Um, but for that reason, I use fewer and fewer textured implants these days. Um, and even uh, tissue expanders are becoming uh, smooth rather than textured now. Um, the second question was about fat grafting. We mentioned that briefly where you do liposuction, spin it down, and kind of recontour the breast. I use it in a lot of different types of breast procedures. They've studied that extensively, and the question was specifically about possible rate of breast cancer and whether that can change anything, because it is essentially bringing um, some stem cells in the fat over to an area where a breast uh, tumor was. Um, that's also been studied relatively extensively, and it appears to be oncologically safe from a cancer perspective. And the difference being that it can, in early stages, add some calcifications, which on mammography can be a little bit uh, uh, kind of confounding and might lead to some future biopsies. Um, but as I shared, I'm not nearly as smart as the rest of the people in this room. So if anyone disagrees with anything that I just said, please, please, especially from the uh, oncology standpoint. But that's sort of my understanding of things. I have a question for you. I get this question all the time from my patients. Uh, um, I'm asking the question for them. Okay, um, you know, do I need to get like MRI to check on my implants? Like, yeah. when do I have to? You know, do I need to replace my implants? It's been five years. It's been ten years. Uh, how do you go about that question? Yeah, what I always tell people, whether it's for cosmetic or for reconstructive purposes, uh, purposes when there's implants involved, is I tell them, like I had mentioned, that implants are not designed to be lifelong devices and that at some point you will likely need something to be done, whether that's you're just kind of done with them and you want them out or you want them replaced or a size change or they've gotten firm or hard or there's any evidence of a possible rupture. And I showed that picture of the silicone implants now that when they leak, it's not like things go anywhere. You don't really tell. The size doesn't change because the gel doesn't liquid. It doesn't sort of migrate. Um, so the only way to really tell whether there's been a kind of undetectable rupture of an implant is to get an MRI. For breast reconstruction patients, that can be a covered benefit because you're following FDA recommendations. The recommendations are to do it at two years and then every three years afterwards um, uh, to detect for silent ruptures of a breast implant. In my mind, that when I go in for someone that has a rupture detected on an MRI, you just remove that along with a capsule that's formed around it, and no silicone kind of comes in contact with breast tissue or skin in a case of mastectomy. Um, so the vast majority of my cosmetic patients, for example, that wouldn't have those MRIs covered, don't get them because they don't want to pay out of pocket. And I kind of support that decision because I don't think that it gives them a whole bunch of extra information. But I do counsel implant patients that these are the things that we look out for um, and the things that might lead to future surgery down the line. So I have two questions. Um, one, the first one is for Dr. Raj, and then the rest is for um, uh, surgery and radiation oncology. Um, uh, touching on the theme of multidisciplinary care, Dr. Raj, would you um, uh, tell us a little bit more about the breast multidisciplinary clinic that's being launched and how you view that from a patient perspective? Um, my understanding is that it's, it's a unique service in the community, not available anywhere in the East Bay. Uh, what are your thoughts? No, I agree. I think this is a great thing for our community and for our patients. You saw how complex the breast cancer treatment is becoming, right? And when we, if we're not in one room like medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, surgeon, it is really hard to make the right decision for our patient because it's truly a multidisciplinary care. So. The, our new breast clinic is going to be, if we see a new patient, they're going to be coming to our office and they'll be seen by all of us at the same time. And we're going to put our brains together and come up with the best decision in terms of treatment option for that patient. Uh, and we're very excited about it and we're going to start that first week of November. And, uh, and I, I mean, I don't, like uh, Dr. Sani mentioned, I don't think we have this multidisciplinary clinic anywhere else in the East Bay. So we're 
pretty proud of that. Um, continuing on the theme of multidisciplinary care, this is a question for Dr. Trekul, Dr. Lee, um, Dr. Ye, and even Dr. Paro. Something that is on the patient's mind always is, is, is in terms of advanced cancer, um, they've had a mastectomy or maybe they've had a new adjuvant chemotherapy lumpectomy. They might need radiation, they might re need reconstruction. Um, it is a complex discussion. How do you strategize and how do you sort of make sure that that multidisciplinary decision making happens and that the patient gets the right treatment? I can speak just from a reconstructive option that when radiation is likely to be needed prior to surgical treatment of the breast, I have a very frank discussion with patients about what that might mean in terms of a reconstruction. First, we kind of get a sense of are we thinking implants or um, a flap reconstruction. And then I talk with them about the benefits and uh, you know the upsides and downsides of doing it right at the time, called an immediate reconstruction, or doing it in a delayed fashion. The risks of a breast reconstruction, if you do it and then radiation is needed, are significantly higher. And the risks, if there's an implant in there and then you go on to radiate that, are things like the incision opening up, the implant getting infected, it having to come out, and it being sort of, you know, and a worst case scenario for my mind is delaying further treatment. So as a reconstructive surgeon, I never want to do anything in the effort of recreating a breast shape to try to improve quality of life that then goes on to delay the oncologic treatment, which is what's going to keep you here for a really long time, which is the primary goal. And so I often have a very, I say, the last thing I want to do is delay the care that you really need, because we can make you a breast at any point based on what is, is necessary. So I often encourage people, if we know that radiation is necessary, to wait on the reconstruction. Um, because I think from an aesthetic outcome too, uh, especially if using your tummy tissue is going to be kind of what we go with, not be bringing in non-radiated skin after the radiation will give you a nice, soft, supple reconstruction, decrease the chances that anything that I've done has delayed treatment because of a complication due to the radiation. And those are my priority goal. My priorities are keeping you safe first and giving you as nice of a reconstruction second. And so that's kind of my approach, but I'd love to hear the other people's thoughts. Yeah, very similar. Um, I'm often one of the last people that a patient meets um, along their journey through breast cancer. So to me, the, the idea of getting um, patients used to the idea that they may need radiation, what that would entail early, is uh, important um, to alleviate a lot of fears and uh, uh, whatnot that come with the sort of uncertainty. Um, coordination of care, uh, knowing you know, will the patient need chemotherapy? When's that going to start? When, you know, radiation comes after chemotherapy. And then with the reconstructive team, it's often a, a question of how many fills are you going to need to do before we can start radiation? You know, I want the, the anatomic shape of the breast to be in its final form. You, you don't like want to fill the breast with, uh, you know, the, the tissue expander during the radiation course because that'll change all of our calculations. So we do a lot of coordination of care. And that can be done up front that will save the patients, I think, a lot of worry um, and a lot of uh, confusion and uh, anger at a time that they don't need to be confused and angry because of a scheduling issue. Uh, um, I just, I just want to um, <clears throat> uh, kind of add to that is that, uh, like I, the example that I gave in, in my talk is like, in the past when we have like a fragmented approach where the patient will go from uh, the surgeon, the cancer surgeon to the plastic surgeon to the medical oncologist to the radiation oncologist in step instead of everybody um, put together a plan for the patient at the beginning. Um, it makes a whole lot of difference because, um, you know, the, the patient's goal of how she looks and um, is combined with um, the patient factor, the tumor factor, and we, by sitting together and looking at the patient's case and we can um, decide like this patient would need these um, therapy and we together, we can design a, um, a sequence of treatment that would uh, provide the patient with a, an oncologically safe outcome and at the same time would, would be able to give the patient the cosmetic outcome that, that she desired, um, whether it's um, 
you know, a, um, a to retain the breast or or to have a mastectomy, but still have a um, a breast that's cosmetically um, looking natural, or maybe no uh, reconstruction at all, and and it's all has to be um, put together at the beginning because you know we know that this patient cancer would definitely um, the patient will need radiation therapy we would um, take in consideration that um, the type of reconstruction and, and when the reconstruction should happen so that uh, the capsular contracture and, and that kind of factor will be, um, will be minimized. <clears throat> Well, if there are no further questions, uh, we should have a round of applause for our esteemed speakers, Edith and Shake. Um, before we close tonight, I um, you know, wanted to um, recognize and honor um, our breast cancer patients and survivors who are with us. Please stand to be recognized. You're the reason why we come to work, and you're the reason why you know all of this is put together. Um, family members and caregivers, please stand up to be recognized. Well, you bear the burden, you bear the journey. Um, thank you for all that you do. Um, everybody who's worked in healthcare, who's ever been touched with cancer, who's involved with cancer fundraising, please rise. With that, thank you very much. There is still some coffee and water in the back and we'll see you next year. Thank you.